So here's a question, um, John, that I want to get to. It's a question that came in from a skeptic of the young earth creation and global flood model. The question is, how could any vegetarian, and in brackets, um, he put trees, bushes, and grass, survive being submerged or even destroyed by salinated water? Okay, it is a good question, and it's one that I asked in the middle of the desert of Western Australia. Um, you see, my background is geology. Uh, I went and did three years of genetics as well. I'd grown up with a dad who loved gardening. My first gardening book, even as a non-Christian, was the old Yates Gardening Guide. Some of you may remember that it started with man was made to live in a garden. And I thought, that's a wonderful idea. Later on, I discovered it straight from Genesis because God made a garden and he put the man in it. So man was made to live in a garden. But that didn't help me figure out how does a gum tree survive a flood? We're here in Australia. We're noted for gum trees because, A, they can actually send their roots down and find the water. But, B, if you flood the earth, this dry land plant, how does it cope? So I had an opportunity. I was with the head of the agricultural section in forestry, and I asked him, I said, see that, that gum tree over there? Um, how does it actually survive? How would it actually survive a flood that went not just 40 days, but over 364 days, plus a few extras, right? And uh, he said, well, simple, actually. He says, the same way they do now. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, built into the tree, and we don't know why, but every now and then in Australia, we have a year where there's a massive rainfall. Some of you may have read up on Jurassic Park. Back in 2011, we had 16 inches of rain, 400 millimetres in four hours. It overwhelmed everything. And now we've got the opposite. We've got a drought. Now, the gum trees live through both. And I'm out in the desert, and this guy said, well, look, come and have a look at this. He said, this tree grows in this pan. He said, this is a little lake bed in wet seasons. But the gum tree stays alive. And he said, sometimes the lake gets so deep, the gum tree should drown. But he said, here's what we've observed. They have a mechanism to turn themselves off. And he says, as soon as the water level gets to the right, you know, humidity, they turn themselves back on again. Now, I had my students, after that conversation, I had my students run Charles Darwin's experiment for seven years to see if those sort of statements held up. What experiment? Well, Charles Darwin still got bottles in the basement of the university uh, in which he collected seeds, dry land plant seeds, wetland plant seeds, grass seeds, vegetable seeds, etc., and he put them in a bottle, filled it up with water. And then every week they would take one out and they would plant them to see what survived. Here's the general results you got. And by the way, I got exactly the same results in my students for seven years in a row. So feel free to try and disprove it. You're not gonna, not gonna be successful. Domestic plants, corn, wheat, peas, all the things that Noah would have taken on the ark as feed for himself, um, they don't survive very well underwater. You put them in water, you end up with pea beer, right? It ferments. They don't do well underwater at all. But all your grass seeds, all of the wild plants, they survive like crazy. I mean, we see it in the real world out here. We have dams. We build massive dams in Australia compared to many countries. And what you find is you flood the dam. The dam will be underwater for 25 years. Then there'll be a mega drought and it will dry out. And instantly the grass comes back up. Now the seed has been there for 10, 20, 30 years. Um, it's not affected by the water at all. So as much as the question seems impossible, when you test this real world, you'll find that the sort of plants that Noah would have taken on board for food actually need to be on board for food. The sort of plants that are going to be outside the ark anyway, the wild animal food, the vegetarian stuff, no trouble at all. It survives now under, underwater at all. And by the way, you have an assumption when you say it was flooded with salt water. Hmm. Uh, we, we do have salt water we dig out of the ground with bores, and we can supply it to most of the plants. Um, they, do, they don't seem to struggle too much with it here in Australia. But if you assume all the floodwaters were salt water, 
you are assuming too much. Here's your assumption. Whatever the C is like now, it's always been. Charles Lyell's principle of uniformitarianism. Uh, don't assume that the present is the key to the past. When God made the world, it was very good and there would have been just enough minerals in the water to do the best for all the fishes that they ever could do. Uh, that's why many saltwater fishes can move into fresh water and vice versa. Uh, and year by year, the amount of salt is actually increasing in the sea. Can you get it? Hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. In the last days, a third of the sea will die. That's the inevitable result, which means one thing. When God made the world, he knew how it could end. Interesting thought. I got to say, uh, John, again, great answer to a common question, a good question with a, a solid answer. I find even the best so-called objections to a young earth and a global flood have uh, very good answers ready to uh, ready to go, as, as you've um demonstrated here john uh george did you have any comments or anything brother before we get to the next next question yeah i'd just like to confirm what john uh, had mentioned um one day when you come up to my lake house john i'll uh i'll show you exactly what uh you were saying about the water the water level of the lake when it drops in those drought years the banks it's amazing how quickly they come up with vegetation the wattle trees the grass the weeds they'll come up and the other thing, of course, after the flood, the soils and the materials would have been rich in mineral minerals, perfect sort of composition for seeds to grow in. Uh, yeah. One other thing I might throw in there, now that I've been a gardener for many, many decades, here's what I've observed. There are some plants that if you submerse them underwater, the first thing they begin to do is swell. They take a certain amount of water in and then they form on the outside an impenetrable barrier. They lock themselves in. It's built into the sea. And that barrier will begin to disintegrate as soon as the humidity outside the search of the, the seed in the ground gets below a certain point, then they'll germinate. So they have an inbuilt mechanism to cope with the right amount and the wrong amount of water. So intelligent design, way above the normal level we used to think about. <laughs> And these inbuilt mechanisms that we frequently talk about, they are evidence of forward thinking, which points us back to the forward thinker. Um, so those are some great points. And, and as you uh, pointed out, John, correct me if I'm wrong, Darwin himself, Charles Darwin himself, helped us with this answer yeah. through his experience. Yeah, got to give credit where credit is due. Yeah. St <laughs> st standing, there's, there's another Australian, I think it's the bottle brush. Uh, John, doesn't it uh, rely on a bushfire to actually germinate? It does. Uh, there's two ways you can take this. One is that it's adapted to actually become fire resistant. But the real history of the plant is that you have a plant which all the non-fire resistant ones have been eliminated to the point where the seed has got such a thick uh, coat on it, a fire is needed. So it's become mm -hmm. degenerate dependent. Right? So it's not an example of creation per se. But it is an example of forward planning to a world which you would have terrible conditions like we have in Australia six years out of ten. Yeah, and evolution doesn't do any forward planning, does it? No, it doesn't do any forward planning. No brains. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please make sure to hit that like button. It really does help. And subscribe if you enjoy the content and want to see more. And find more of us on our main channel on Team Standing for Truth. This is Matt Mann. Until next time.